OK, I think uh, we will uh, get underway again. We all, technical crew, we're all good? All right, let's do that. Well, we're now going to uh, go to questions uh, from the floor and from the net and from our journalists, and I'd like to introduce them. Rob O'Neill, Sunday Star Times business editor, to my immediate left, and next to him, Sarah Pott, uh, computer world editor. They have actually been busy uh, since before we began looking online and looking at the questions that are coming in. They have some questions of their own. So, um, Sarah. Well, I think um, the first one, if we can just go to um, Stephen Joyce. Uh, Nigel McNee asks, um, and he's not alone, uh, what is Joyce, what, Joyce, what is your Twitter handle? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, Stephen L. Joyce. Steve, thank you. Um, Perhaps if we go to another one that has also been talked about, and that's the digital divide. Everybody brought it up um, except for the ACT Party. Um, it's an interesting one. We're just rolling out, or you're just rolling out UFB and the RBI. Rural people can expect five megabits per second. Urban people from 30 megabits per second. How do the panels suggest we bridge that digital divide? Is it possible? Um, what do the panellists think? Well, well. Uh, Let's start with Pete. Well, well the, f the first response would be that if you're living in a rural area, you n then naturally things are going to be different than if you live in the city. I don't expect people in a rural area to subsidise my rent or my car parking just because they happen to live in big wide open spaces with low house prices and low land prices and I have high house prices and high land prices. So things are going to be different in different places. If you're talking specifically about low income people, then like I said, I don't think passing some law that says that you know it's a fundamental human right to have internet is necessarily going to get everyone a New Zealand internet. I think the best way to do that is increase incomes and improve living standards. And the way we do that is through our economic policies, uh, which I think ACT has the best economic policies to grow the economy and help out those people who are most in need. So. Gareth, you want to address Yeah, I mean, as with any problem, you've got to start by acknowledging it, and it would be great to have a minister talking about it uh, and raising some genuine Pass questions across, around it. I mean, in regards to that Brazilian bill, I mean, that's why I recommend we look at it, because we actually need a rights and responsibilities and look at it. That's why I've been active trying to um, promote library access uh, for people, so they can at least go to their public library. But lastly, I mean, the, the, the point is we need to see a little bit of leadership on it. We need to seriously address the, the problem and uh, come up with some solutions. Stephen Joyce, do you want to write a reply on that? Oh, well, um, I think well, the, fact, the simple fact of the matter is we are acting on it, and I think the challenge, um, and it actually might help answer um, Peter's question about why fibre, um, because I don't know about anybody else, but I've been racking my brain to find something else that delivers large volumes of data more effectively and more quickly than fibre. And the answer is I don't think anybody's uh, thought of anything at this point. Uh, you, you're right, you have to be careful that you pick on a technology which is going to last for a long period of time. And by taking fibre both, both around our urban areas, uh, where there is of course much more contention because you've got great, much greater higher uh, population density, and then around our rural areas so that you can then use things like fixed wireless and 4G uh, to improve the quality of uh, the actual digital link up in rural areas where there is less contention. I mean, to me, that seems a reasonably sensible thing, way to approach it because uh, it just reflects the fact that in low population density areas, you can use other technologies besides fibre to deliver higher speed broadband than you can in the cities where you have much greater com uh, contention uh, for, for the... For the um, uh, wireless type um, wireless type technologies. So I think the short answer is actually we're doing that. Um, and so Gareth, with the greatest respect, just um, sitting there saying the first thing to do is acknowledge the problem. Well, we acknowledged the problem three years ago and we're acting on it. But like, right, um, hang on. Well, clear, I want to clear a shot here. Rubbish is what <laughs> I'd say. Um, first oh, thing, nice, well, the first thing to say is that um, the reason why we have a rural broadband scheme and an urban <laughs> scheme is because there was a, um, a commitment given by your government uh, as the National Party to deliver broadband to 75% of the population. So you had to come up with two different schemes. Um, the rural community in general doesn't like the fact that they're the poor cousins to the UFB. And our policy and what we think is that we should as much as possible encourage that UFB to be pushed out into the regions, remove any legislative impediments to do that and, and encourage as much as possible to, to get it out there. Now, the Australians have taken the opposite 
position in terms of how they're rolling out broadband. They're doing an, uh, an outside-in policy. They're starting in the parts of the country where the market isn't and is unlikely to go without a lot of encouragement. What we're doing is looking as if we're going to do more overbuild in the cities and then there's going to be some uh, broadband delivered in the rural areas. Now, if you had a vision, if your um, party had a vision for uh, New Zealand around being a digital nation, you would have looked at it and thought, well, where do we need to invest uh, where the market won't go? And do we want more New Zealanders having the options to go and live in rural New Zealand and set up businesses? Not everybody who lives in rural New Zealand is a rich farmer. There are communities that are struggling. Now, couldn't we give them a boost by giving them better broadband? And, and why do they have yeah, to have Carpenter lesser Smith, broadband? That might be a good spot for you to come in yeah. on this question. Kia ora. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that the Māori Party's view of equality is about equality of outcomes, not equality of input. <clears throat> and in that vein, we should be supporting people to access what we consider to be important infrastructure, which is the internet. We pay for roads, therefore we should pay for internet because it's about accessing education and accessing a world of information, but also about our citizenship rights to participate in society, no matter where you live. Kia ora. All right, well, I'm going to come back, I'm going to come, come back to another question because we want to get through them. Rob, have you got something? Yeah, sure. Um, do you see, just following up on that, there's been questions from uh, Paul Hayton about um, what role libraries would have in, in bri um, bridging the digital divide. Is there any party that has a policy in that area on, on the role of libraries? I can um, perhaps say that um, as part of the RBI in particular, but also the UFB, uh, we're, we're now looking to um, expand those high priority areas to include the libraries and we think we can actually do that within the budget for, for RBI which is pretty exciting. Um, so as well as the other community nodes that we're focusing on and also in um, and you know, the health and education areas uh, that we can add, we can add uh, rural libraries into that again to provide those sort of connection hubs uh, and another option uh, for people to, um, uh, to to connect, but again, I, I think those the, the the key point to beating the digital divide, you know, the limiting factor in for many of those rural communities is the lack of fibre optic cable into those communities that links them into the network. That's the fundamental problem we have to solve, and once we've done that, as we've seen with the RBI, is you can do a whole range of other things with fixed wireless with. Uh, with copper DSL, you can do um, you can do 4G mobile, a whole range of things, which are enabled by making sure that you have fibre into those communities. Um, just on that note, um, W. J. Allen on Twitter suggests that the 700 megahertz spectrum, that's the spectrum that comes available once the analog TV is switched off, that would be a perfect vehicle for in, um, for prioritising rural rollouts, maybe getting the, the telcos, the mobile telcos to prioritise a rural um, rollout with your 4G. What is your policy there on 700 megahertz spectrum? Should, should priority be given to rural or will it be an auction um, where the who pays the most gets the best? Well, um, uh, the, the rural broadband partners have committed to rolling out 4G as, as part of their um, part of their plan, assuming that they obtain some of the spectrum. Uh, and, um, and of course, there's a discussion document out right now in terms of how spectrum should be allocated for 4G. But I think you're right. One of the good things about 4G spectrum and how it um, propagates is that it's quite suitable to go over much longer distances from cell towers and 3G can and be, and be pretty effective. So, so you can actually um, have probably a larger digital footprint in those areas with 4G than you can have, uh, than you can have with 3G. And uh, that will also make it more economic, I have to say as well, to roll it out because you need less towers and that suits the lower population density areas. Um, yeah, I just um, there is a process already underway, um, which you know is going to be interrupted by the election. Um, there is an auction plan. Um, have you set a time for that um, for next year? Is when it's expected to take place? No, no. If there's not, no, I think they'll be allocated in 2000 and uh, late 12. 2012, 2013. Yeah, which is next there's year. a there's a there's a process. <laughs> what was that? Was that? Um, yeah, that's right. Um, it is supposed it's to be generous of you to agree. Next, next year. <laughs> next, um, next year. And and it's it is it is really critical that 
area of spectrum um, and I think we both agree on its importance going forward. Um, what and how um, and who it should go to is, you know, is another matter. One of the most important things is that it's done very transparently. Um, and that there is a public discussion around the digital, um, around the digital dividend, and around how that money gets spent and what it should be spent on, and I think that is really important. I don't know whether the minister has made any um, pronouncements, um, particularly around that. Um, well, and well, income from the spectrum would be yeah, spectrum. and and also and and with and just how transparent that process should be. And I think this is a point to make. And I know that Gareth has talked about this a little bit, and what he's said tonight is that transparency in these processes is absolutely critical. In the broadband, whole of the broadband debate, one of the big issues was lack of transparency. Um, I so don't I, think that's I correct at all. I know yeah, that's your view. Yeah, I, mean, I just want to agree with Claire. I think she makes some great points. Um, to go to that library question, to be fair, many of the functions of li I mean, libraries are a council responsibility. I did some research, which I think you can see on the Frog blog on State of the Libraries, and it's only about a quarter of libraries actually provide free internet access in New Zealand. Yet UNESCO is saying it should be 100%, and that's uh, what we need. And just to, to go back to that issue of how we get internet to the libraries, many of our rural communities are missing out from the government's initiatives on the RBI. I was up in Gisborne last week, and what you, I saw there was the local net consortium, which uh, encompassed iwi, the local businesses, totally missed out on the contract. What we're seeing is just a big backhaul fibre from Gisborne up to Hicks Bay. Uh, yet all these schools that are in, in the inland of the east coast um, are missing out. Uh, so th they're annoyed that they've built up these relationships over decades with people and iwi, yet they're missing out. The, the, well the, the, the problem is that this isn't actually just about picking the current best technology. Stephen talked about, you know, I had a good hard think about it and I couldn't come up with anything that's currently better than Fiber. But the, the problem is it's not actually just about what's best now. It's about how the government getting involved in these markets and distorting them and chucking money at them actually affect incentives for people who are trying to invest in these areas. So if you're, you're talking about people who are trying to do research and development into new ways of doing it that might be better than Fiber, now they're suddenly having to compete against a government that's got... Um, funds that it can just tax off the public and throw at it and beat the competition. So uh, if, if you're an entrepreneur that's trying to come up with something like this and you see Stephen Joyce saying, no, fibre is the solution, well, then you're probably going to go elsewhere to come and try and come up with your great new idea that's going to be better than fibre. So it's not just about what's best now. It's about how the government distorts those markets when it tries to get involved and, and messes up what's going on in the market and the innovation that's going on there. So it's actually much more deeper. Rob? Yep. Um, question. Um, New Zealand is a hub of digital manufacturing and making. How does the panel plan to support and nurture that? What do you guys should go first? I'm happy to do it. Okay, well, I'll dive in. Bugger it. Um, the, um, I think it is a hub of digital manufacturing and, uh, and digital, um, and, and basically digital industries. And uh, I took an ICT, uh, ICT, um, trade mission to China last year and it was one of the most exciting things I've been able to do as a minister which is going with 20 or 30 entrepreneurs uh, who are really just taking on the world. They travel and uh, have, you know, they bring their stuff in a suitcase and they go out there and they make the relationships and they, and, they, and they do all the things that we would want them to do. And when you talk to them about what's important and they will talk to you pretty much about connectivity uh, and making sure that, that New Zealand has those links to the world from a, from a um, broadband perspective. They don't really want you to try and do it for them. They want uh, great trade relationships. They think that's important. Uh, they want to know that, uh, that the government is very active in the trade area and is involved in uh, opening doors in, 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 in countries where, where, where they have the opportunity to do that with things such as the uh, you know, Chinese uh, FTA and the, the other FTAs that we're looking to sign up at the moment. That's the sort of things that they're looking for. Uh, and uh, I think those are the things we've got to stay really focused on as a country because those are the sort of people we need to succeed. Well, what we see is New Zealand ranked quite lowly to many other comparative nations in terms of research and development spend. That's a simple no-brainer, which I think some of us on this panel can agree. And another point is that we haven't had progress on the patents bill through Parliament, which I know many people would like to see some progress there. Um, can I just say that I agree with you, Stephen, um, around the uh, sort of external focus in our trade relationships, but what's missing 
is mm. uh, is an is investment in skills. We're currently importing, I think it is 2,000 people um, a year from outside New Zealand because we're not growing them inside New inside our own country. We are going to put specific commitments around um, investing in um, going from 200 interns in existing companies doing R&D products uh, projects to a thousand a year. And which the future is, digital, this document actually identifies a lack yeah. of top end and, skills. And going well. from schools into career paths. That's the big, big bit that's missing. And I hear this in every conference, every forum I go to, is, is how do you get from education um, into career pathways and where are they? Now, this government has taken the, the view and that we do have good organisations out there, NZICT, etc. You are doing a good job, but you, the government does need to play a role in, in helping bring together and and create those and help create those pathways and make sure that they do exist. I've got two 11 year olds. They're both creative. Um, I want them to stay in New Zealand. I don't want them to take their, their you know to go overseas because they they can get better jobs and because they can earn more money. I think they will end up in this sector. I want them to stay there. So I've got a vested interest. I've got a school in my electorate, Forbury School, which is one of the lowest mm. decile, um, most deprived schools in the country. Uh, there are kids that are creative at, that, at those schools. How are they going to get, how is their potential going to be recognised? And Kapua, and, clearly through, and the, yeah, Kapua, through the policy you've announced this evening, this is a, a big part of the Māori Party's view or hopes for yes. the digital future? We would agree with Claire that one of our focuses would be on establishing a workforce and one of the programmes that we have already um, committed to is supporting the RBI and the UFB rollout through Ngāpū Wire um, and in their terms of reference um, one of their roles is to look for opportunities for Māori training and apprenticeships as well as opportunities for participation in the wider industry. Um, yeah. Peter McCaffrey, would you say just pay people more if they want to be, if you want people well, in IT? Well, no, it, we, we need to improve New Zealand's economy if we want people to stay in New Zealand, and that's an entirely different debate that we can have another day. But um, look, if you, if you want people to be here in New Zealand innovating, then you have to actually provide uh, the circumstances to allow them to do so, whether it's regulatory environment or rules or red tape or anything like that. Um, having said that, we do still... Uh, have good companies that are doing that. People, uh, people like Zero here in Wellington, who have actually gone international now and are actually um, uh, bringing a lot of money back to New Zealand and helping us out here. So it is possible, but I'd like to make it easier and get the government out of the way and let people do that. Sean, can I just touch on the whole vocational pathway thing? Because it's something that I want to agree with Claire on, and I don't get that opportunity every day. Um, and um, what's what's really um, good about that is that actually that's something that we've got underway, this whole idea of vocational pathways from school into, into particularly um, industrial type training and te technology training and ICT training. And one of the challenges is that there's a very straightforward academic pathway in New Zealand schools into universities. But when you want to talk about ITPs and, um, and uh, that sort of training, uh, it's, less, it's less obvious. So we've been working with the Industry Training Federation and set up these five vocational pathways uh, which includes um, the ICT stream, and that will actually simplify things for young people that are at, say, perhaps NCA level two, what sort of uh, subjects they should be taking as they want to head down that pathway without making them decide whether they want to be a particular type of tech technological person or, for example, in the building and construction trade, making them decide at 16 whether they want to be a plumber or whatever, making them, uh, just getting them into a stream which says you're going to learn these, sort of, these sorts of trades if you're in the construction sector and you're in the ICT sector, and I think that's actually going to be, work out very well. Okay. That, that question was from Northwoods DS, I just didn't credit that. Um, Polar Bear Farm is asking, he'd um, uh, like to hear policy on ICT procurement in government as it relates to extreme wastage in government. How are you going to reduce wastage and reduce IT project failure in government? And, um, and how it c could be used to uh, help build local I ICT companies? Well, um, Labor announced a procurement policy a couple of months ago, which was um, targeted at uh, our more traditional manufacturing industries as well as our uh, new technology um, industries and and how government spends its money uh, in making sure that we are investing tr as much as possible inside our own economy. So that is absolutely critical part of our policy mm -hmm. and we want uh, to use uh, government spend as much as possible 
to uh, ensure that we're investing in local innovative companies, and which is why we've got a whole section in here around open source. We have a growing community of innovators in this country who are developing new software. Uh, new, that's where government can take a lead by looking at how it can invest um, in, a, in a fair way um, in, in using those um, the technologies that they're developing. And cost savings um, accrue. Um, I'm sure Gareth will want to say some stuff about sustainability and environmental um, policies. And I certainly think that within Internet New Zealand's roadmap that they've released today, there are some really good ideas um, that we can build on. Well, I think in terms of open source, which I was going to agree with Claire, and uh, I just want to acknowledge Nandor Tanchos's work. So we've got quite a substantial open source policy, and in fact, a constituency office running entirely on open source software. And you know, I've seen some big failures when it comes to open source, and I've seen some big successes. I've been trying to quantify how much our government is actually spending on proprietary software. I can't get a number, but I'm sure it's a fantastically huge sum. So I'm sure there's cost savings. I'm sure there's benefits to the local industry if we went down this path. Um, but it, again, it goes back to Claire's point. If we're going to have a government which is going to stand back, unlike many other countries, and refuse to purchase Kiwi or with other requirements on it, we're missing out. So that's why we support uh, a smart procurement policy. Well, I think um, we do, we've got to start from the point of why we're doing things. And we certainly want smarter, more effective public services, and we're putting a huge amount of effort into that. Um, there is a massive ICT spend across government by New Zealand standards, uh, and there's a massive number of projects. Frankly, frankly, there's a massive amount of catch-up to be done. So if you talk about whether it's the immigration software, the custom software, driver licensing software, it's been left uh, undone for years and years and years. And we actually have this huge bow wave now of investment in ICT projects to try and get government online. That's one of the interesting things about lecturing the community how to get online. Actually, government doesn't do a lot of that very well. And so we've done a number of things in that respect, and one of them is to make sure that we have a cluster of ministers who can monitor these projects as ministers, and then a bunch of people uh, alongside them who can peer review all those projects and drive them through uh, and, and make sure that they're successful. But you know, the challenge with the greatest respect is not whether you use Google Docs or Microsoft Word, the challenge is actually the proprietary stuff around um, the interactive database uh, stuff that, that it is you know, generally those bigger players, uh, which you actually have to get under control and make sure you don't end up with that famous 20-year-old word INSYS um, running around loose in this process. So it is pretty challenging, something that governments don't, I think, historically do that well, and that's why we've got such a massive... I've mentioned some, but there's MSD, there's IRD. I mean, all of these ones are dealing with antiquated platforms. Actually, MSD um, has upgraded themselves, but IRD is a massive issue because of how old their stuff is. How are they meant to do that when you're, you're chopping about the public service? Who, who are the public servants? Who, who can well, no, they're making the, actually, they're, they're making the capital investment in that stuff to, to precisely make it more efficient. Um, and one of the issues that we've got is that, you know, for example, making changes to the IRD databases is incredibly hard. We've been doing some work in student loans in that area of making sure that actually people pay off their student loans. You've got to do a massive amount of workarounds to actually achieve those outcomes. So you've got to just, you, you do have to make that investment so that you can have more efficient public services, and that's a balancing act because, as you know, things are fiscally tight. Um, we'll take one more from here and then we'll go to the floor. Just a quick uh, turnaround. We talk a lot about um, how do we stimulate demand? How do we get people to take up the services? Not everybody is excited about fibre coming to their house, but unless they take it up, the investment won't be um, given back to those pe uh, to the companies, the service companies that are providing it. What, uh, Peter GNZ asks um, uh, Stephen Joyce, what are you doing to encourage services like Hulu, iPlayer, Netflix to set up in New Zealand? What's the hold up? Double question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, well, actually, um, we're focusing on a number of areas. We've got this um, uh, five-point action plan, which we've been developing on the demand side. The most important thing, though, that you can do, first of all, is make your prices competitive. Um, if you can do that, then that will help things. So we've determined that the price points for the UFB and the RBI are, are very competitive to what's already in the marketplace, but give you higher levels of service. And that way you can ensure that the uh, commercial players uh, in the content space actually do want to, to be part of the market because they can see a commercial opportunity for the uh, models like Netflix. Um, the real involvement from the government's point of view is to do the sort of things that we've been talking about in education, in health, 
any government to make sure that we get our services sorted out as well, because otherwise, you, know, you really want people to be able to and to, and to have a, an easy relationship with government services online. And if we can't do that, then we're you know it's a bit hard work lecturing everybody else that that's something that they should do. So the fundamental question is making sure the price is competitive. And with the UFB, we've got wholesale prices which are competitive with the best copper prices now, but the services are way beyond that. Well, with all due respect to the Minister, what we are talking about the RBI and the UFB is digging big holes and laying some fibre down. And no, it well, seems like the government it. is stuck on this and we aren't having a conversation about what we can actually do with it. And if there is this mythical five-point plan around you know, uh, online legal content, I mean, why didn't we see it before the copyright debate was passed under urgency? So you've had time to read the Brazilian one, but not our one. Um, <laughs> can I just say that it, the video um, component of the UFB is actually really, really important, and you know I hope you do acknowledge that. Um, and at the moment, you know, there's a big question mark over how that content is going to be delivered. We can't get Netflix in this country. That's a model. I don't know if you've actually had a chance to go and have a look it up, look it up to see what it is. But we can't get it. We don't have the ability to get those sorts of services in this country. Our concern, and I'm sure the concern of a lot of people out there, um, is will we end up with a monopoly in that content space of Sky? that has the rights to all the content, where you have to subscribe through their service to get it and, and pay their prices to get it, which is going to lock out a lot of people from having access. Can you give us a guarantee that won't happen, Stephen Joyce, if you well, were the, to be really? The Commerce Commission has the, you know, we don't need another regulator, the Commerce Commission has the ability to go in there now, and in fact they are doing a demand side study on exactly the thing that Claire they raises. Have jurisdiction in that area. No, they do actually have jurisdiction in that area, and they're doing that study now. But the um, that's why it's called a study, Stephen. But the the point is that you know these things do change over time, and the point I would make to you is that you know there were a lot of people being very concerned that we didn't have iTunes in this country, uh, which we of course now do have, and um, you know, I'm absolutely confident you get the price right, the model will evolve. And it actually does allow, at the moment, if somebody wants to distribute a movie to somebody's house in this country, then it's Hobson's choice, it's Sky. But as soon as you get the UFB rolled out, and let's face it, it's just it's, it's underway now, as soon as you get that rolled out, then they'll have other methods of actually delivering the same thing. And if they want to go around Sky, they'll be able to. Right now, they can't. Peter, uh, Peter just wanted to... I, I think that Sky will never have a monopoly on content in New Zealand because that's not how the internet works and it just shows that particularly Labour's policy that was released this week is just going back to what I said in my introduction, it's, it's not keeping up with how the internet works and, and these guys don't understand this, that the internet is international and all that content is available already in New Zealand illegally and somebody around the world is going to find out a way to uh, monetize that and access that internationally and you're going to pay your $50 a month to some international company or that might have servers based in New Zealand or maybe someone in New Zealand will come up and do this as well and you'll get all your movies and your TV and your music through that. It doesn't have to be Sky and, and there's no reason to assume that it will be Sky. Why, why would it? The, um, uh, there have been several uh, people tweeting about software patents. Um, they want to know some clarity around what the party's positions are on that. There is a new patent act that's been described on Twitter as languishing for two years. Um, people want to know why, and they want to know what each party's policy is on software patents. Okay, Peter, we'll do it from Peter all the way down. You got um, a policy on that? I, I don't think ACT does have a uh, policy on uh, patents, but it's certainly something I'm concerned about. I okay. think that the Gareth? Well, I mean, we've just got to acknowledge in New Zealand we're a net importer of this stuff, so um, it's disappointing that it's languished for so long. And I know Claire's been quite vocal about trying to stir the government on, but you know, there's um, surveillance legislation passed under urgency, there's copyright legislation passed under urgency. What we're not seeing is action on. So you'd make your policy is to make it a priority? Yep. Okay, clear. Well, I have a section in my policy on yep. it. I sat on the select committee. I heard the submissions. We came up with a, an agreed position with which the government adopted that um, software patents, um, that software could not be patentable, that it would be covered by copyright. That is the is where the legislation is, and it's still sitting on the books. And I ask why, and is it to do with the Trans-Pacific Partnership? All right. Well, uh, Stephen Joyce, we'll, we'll, we'll just. We'll come back to Kapu in a second. 
Um, I think you're seeing a conspiracy theory there, Claire. Not that that's ever happened before, but um, no. Look, it's, we're committed. It's just time. It's just time in the house. That's the issue. If you keep it secret, you're going to get conspiracy theories. It's so why don't you release it? One of the main it? issues that's been um, yeah. is being put out there is intellectual property and the patents bill is being is is being told to us by people giving briefings on the TPPA that that is one of the issues still on the table. It was, uh, yeah. Well, that actually yeah. explicitly said yeah. that uh, some of the stuff has been held down. My, my understanding is that we've accepted the recommendation. It's literally time in the House. All right. Uh, Kapua. On. Māori Party doesn't currently have a software patents policy. All right. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to open it up to the floor now. Do we have any questions uh, from the floor? Now, we've got the roving mics there, so just wait till the microphone comes up. Okay, hang on, we just want to get that microphone on. Is it switched on? Is, it, is there a switch there? Okay, on the bottom? Okay, well, okay, it's on now. Just give us a wee test if you could. No, we're still dead. Can we get the other microphone across there? We'll get that one back to you. Okay. All right. Away you go. That's, that's loud and clear. Okay, so as you may be aware, um, the last three months there's been sort of the geothermal nuclear war of uh, software patents that the industry has been discussing for the last 20 years or so, which is Apple essentially moving to block um, Samsung in uh, both uh, Australia, our, our neighbours, and in the EU. So <laughs> th this is a very real issue now, um, and we have a, a quite workable legislation that, as, as, uh, as the panellists have pointed out, has been through select committee and everyone, at least in New Zealand, bar a few international companies represented by a biased group, um, who I won't name, uh, are happy with. So why is it sitting on the table for two years? And I'll put the question again, why don't you do that as one of your last acts of parliament, been in term for four years? I spent four years of my life on that bloody, as part of my master's thesis. Everyone's happy with it. Why has it not been passed? You, you pass a copyright legislation that had, hadn't been um, discussed and agreed on to. Too late now, I suspect, to reconvene the House. Um, although we we'll maybe get together and talk to the leaders of the House. Um, no, we, we, we literally can't do it now before the election. But um, um, I just point out, you know, the whole the House runs on, on a whole range of timetables. It's the intersection of you know forty odd portfolios in terms of what happens when. Uh, and uh, sorry that that one just didn't get time to get through the House. I've got a few that I want to get through as well, and I can't get them through. Okay, uh, this gentleman over here, if we could have the microphone back that way. <laughs> have we got that other one operating yet? No. Come to you. Okay. Uh, evening, the panel. I've, I've actually got to start with a comment that it's actually, I think, a sign of how the internet works. We've got everyone sitting in a room, actually having a discussion, and getting all the the. And there's more commonality that I can see than differences on the whole. Um, so many issues I'm passionate have come out about tonight, but I'm tossing up between making, which I know um, clear shares, and rural. And I think I, I have to go for rural because my question is, it's been talked about that there's the UFB and the RBI, but there's actually a whole bunch of people in the middle that are neither. The UFB stops at the urban boundaries, the RBI, in terms of the coverage, is the people then out in what was Zone 4 under the old uh, operational separation requirements. An awful lot of New Zealand lives in Zone 3. An awful lot of New Zealand's wealth lives in Zone 3. In terms of schools and school coverage, there actually had to be some pick-up to cover the fact that most rural kids go to schools in Zone 3, not in Zone 4. That's the little country schools. The, the rest of the economy that lives in Zone 3, what's happening for those people? They don't get RBI, they don't get UFB. What's happening? You're, you're arguing there's a twilight zone there. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah we're, we're being handed. There's actually a three speed internet being created. And well, I disagree, the, the, if I may say. Well, because the reason that Zone 3, as you know, I think, um, didn't get um, the same stuff as Zone 4 is that it's, uh, that it's in that area which is already getting uh, the. Um, uh, the uh, ADSL rollout of the old telecom under operation separation that these guys set up. So the 75 out to 84% is getting that. The 84% onwards is getting nothing until the RBI comes along. 
Um, the schools in the, uh, despite the rumours to the contrary, the schools in that zone three were always getting fibre. Uh, that 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 uh, contract didn't go out because it didn't go out straight away because you had to define the boundaries of the of the 75 percent because before you put that contract out. But the reality of it is 75 percent fibre to the home, and then the rest. Um, making sure that minimum of uh, five to ten megs, um, and that's driven by um, the fact that the ADSL has already occurred from 75 to 84, but also fibre to all those schools. I, I want to ask a, a sort of supplementary question on that, and I, I noted a, a story uh, I think about the time that Steve Jobs died. That India had made its own version of the tablet computer and was essentially providing it for next to nothing to every uh, tertiary student in, in India. Um, if we're not just talking about rolling out the fibre, um, do you all have a vision of schools where every kid does have a tablet computer? Uh, they're not carrying A4 exercise books um, on their backs anymore, but they are linked in and online 24-7, uh, and they've got cloud account accounts where all their homework and their projects are. Is, is that the goal for all of you? Yes. Yes. Can I answer that? I mean, all I can say is we've got more policy coming. Okay. I mean, I think it would be cool, and I've forgotten the name of the company I saw at Barcamp, mm -hmm. but they had a fantastic, cheap uh, New Zealand computer they were exporting, doing some great work. Um, yeah, we should be encouraging. I mean, the model we can't go down is it must be an iPad and locked into that Apple mm -hmm. world. And just your comment spurred me, The I think it was a founder or a CEO of Netflix recently said, look, Apple's monopoly position on content is one of the worst things to happen to the internet uh, for a long time. So, uh, Yep, although I think probably most kids have internet on their phone already now by, yeah. by what I'm seeing, so I imagine it'll happen within a couple of years anyway. Okay. All right. And I'm a bit yes and a bit no. Yes, I want our kids to have access to the very best tools for the education, but as a parent I've seen my two-year-old addicted to an iPad and I'm, it's not a pretty sight. All right. <laughs> okay. um, another question over here, Alistair. G'day. Um, so Internet in New Zealand is twice as expensive and half as fast as it currently is in Australia, and we're going backwards at the moment. So the question is this, is the internet fast enough in New Zealand and what are you going to do about it? And secondly, um, how will you, specifically, how will you fix the backhaul and international pricing obstacles, which currently mean that we're building fibre to nowhere, essentially? All the content is on the other side of the sea. Mm. Who wants to start with that one? More content, more content in New Zealand being created in New Zealand. Um, if we can uh, encourage uh, co content uh, data centres in this country, uh, we've got lots of electricity. Um, we could, we can build them, and we could uh, be attracting them. Um, and competition. Uh, important as much as we possibly can encourage that uh, new cable that's um, a new cable being built across um, the world so that we bring those prices down and that we do something about data caps. Data caps are one of the um, big issues um, that is going to uh, constrain <coughs> people's ability to use the, um, the technology and uh, and at the moment, you know, what, what I, I'm interested to know what Mr. Joyce's policy is on that. And in terms of speed, I know it's called ultra fast broadband, but it's not really. <laughs> well, what speed would you like, Claire? Well, I'd like um, I'd like to get delivered what you said you would deliver, which was a hundred. What, what about catching up with Australia, Stephen Joyce? Well, exactly. Um, I guess. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Yeah. Koreans are the Koreans are out there. They're fantastic. Um, the um, so so let's just run through a couple of things there. Firstly, uh, in terms of the international space, I think you're right. That is a choke point, um, and uh, you'll know or maybe know that there's been a significant um, investment by the government and the Karen Networks International bandwidth, which has allowed them to become a cornerstone uh, cornerstone customer. Of the uh, of the uh, additional uh, one, the Pacific Fibre is putting together. Well, they're getting their uh, they're getting their customers, but of course, as as you know, my view is that that will happen. That will happen whether it's Pacific Fibre or another one. It will happen because the customers are there, and it's all about them nailing down those deals. And they've nailed down three or four already. I understand, so that will happen. 
Um, what will drive that is again a uh, greater uh, bandwidth requirement of New Zealanders, which, which if you look at the choke point, which is last mile access, um, that's the choke point that we're addressing. The other thing that's really important is the competition in the retail space. But it depends on who, what your view is, but uh, it seems uh, there's certainly a, a, a very strong school of thought out there which suggests that it's not international bandwidth that's causing the problem with data caps, that it's actually the way the industry is set up in this country. Uh, and the way to deal with that is much greater competition at the retail layer. And the way to get much greater competition at the retail layer is actually structural separation, which is one of the great benefits of UFB as it's resolved, is that structural separation is occurring. It's something that the previous government toyed with but then didn't go with. Uh, and I think it is important and will actually really improve the competitive nature of the business. And I think you'll see, um, well, you already are seeing actually, um, people starting to position themselves with much greater data caps and those data caps will disappear over time. I mean, just to respond to the career analogy, that's where we have to be. You know, as a vision, trying to, um, you know, we talk about ambitious for the country and a brighter future. You know, we need to be looking at that. And I, I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert on Korean internet. I quickly Googled it. I and mean, what the CNN is saying, they did it. I mean, it's not an accident Korea has the fastest internet in the world. It's because they had a plan. It's because they had open networks. because they fostered competition. They fostered a culture of internet use, so even amongst housewives. Uh, and in New Zealand, you know, I think we're failing our kids when it comes to education uh, of, of digital and online uh, means at schools. It's a hodgepodge, you know, some DSL1 schools are great, some are terrible. Uh, obviously, I agree with the others, and I finally get to say a green uh, sustainability point. You know, on the data centre thing, this is an opportunity for New Zealand. We've got, you know, more than two-thirds renewable electricity at the moment. Uh, this is a real chance for us to take a, uh, a niche of that international data centre trade where we can brand ourselves as clean green, and that's where the world does want to go. Uh, <laughs> another question here. Thanks. Uh, this is to Mr. Joyce. Um, obviously, you can't physically connect all schools to ultra-fast broadband at the same time, all at once. So what specific steps are you taking to ensure that it isn't always the lower DSAIL schools, the DSAIL 1 and 2 schools, of the kids who don't have internet at home? What specific steps are you taking to ensure it's them that aren't always going to be last in terms of connecting to the ultra-fast? Uh, well, the, the, um, there's, a, the, the, there's a whole range of schools with different deciles being connected right now. So one of the early ones, for example, will be one of the ones that's often talked about because the principal is so passionate about it, which is Point England um, in Auckland. Um, it's literally a case of, it's just how, the way the rollout's going to be done is just how practical it is to do it as quickly as it can. Everybody wants it tomorrow. That's the reality of it, um, and uh, which is quite exciting because all the schools are keen as um, to get it. Uh, and the answer is just as quickly as you can put it together. Um, but, but there are some areas of the country that are easier to do than others and you want to get as many schools hooked up as you can so different densities are done at different times. But it's not desired on particular deciles or anything else, it's just um, how do you build this whole thing out in four years. Okay, um, we'll take uh, another one for the audience at the back here. Oh, I think, does it work? Um, just a question to all parties. It was touched on by Mr. Joyce before. I mean, what do you see as the specific contribution of uh, universities, polytechnics, and students to your future visions and policies? Good question. Clear. Oh, well, uh, absolutely critical. Um, one of the things that I, um, I'd like to say is, uh, is around that interface again between school and the tertiary education is that computer science is something that we could be, um, there could be a lot more effort being put into teaching computer science in schools and, ha and ensuring that we've got pe uh, teachers in schools that are skilled in teaching uh, at that level at school because as far as I under am aware, and um, the tertiary education minister might correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that at the moment we're not. And, and it is something looking forward for the future, is that we've got to start that process so that we're not just teaching ICT skills um, in terms of being able to use computers uh, and use them effectively in that digital sense that we all need to have the skills in, but that we're actually teaching the science of it and the uh, ability to go further through into um, the tertiary environment and we're treating that more importantly. Because if we want to then move into uh, those people to come out of university with the skills to go and in, uh, into do R&D and, and in 
in New Zealand companies and innovate and build stuff and make stuff that can be exported uh, and build our economy, then that's surely what we need, we need to be doing. I agree on the education point, and I've made it before, but did anyone else see that wonderful study that 90% of people don't know how to use Control F, and uh, they quantified the amazing amount of time is wasted every day across the world because people don't know how to use Control F? Just one uh, little example of our failing education system. I, I mean, obviously the universities are important. Um, I thought you were going to ask a question on student associations, David. But, I mean, one, uh, to answer the negative, I don't think the copyright bill, the Skynet bill, is helping that. I mean, what we've seen is uh, people at Auckland University talking about it's going to take them around $50 each uh, notice sent for them to manually process it, and them as the accountant hold with 30,000 students at Auckland University. Um, that's a significant uh, liability for, for, for the account holder, which is the institution, to cope, given they're responsible for all internet activity by all those people on the, on the account. And just another example how we in fact make it harder for universities to do well at internet, not better. Peter? Uh, well, I'm still at university, um, and the internet there sucks. Um, <laughs> but that's not because they haven't got a big honking pipe. They have. It's just because they try and make it free, and they try and offer it to everyone. And so everyone just goes and watches YouTube while you're trying to do your assignments. So, yeah. <laughs> Would you pay? Oh, look, I, I, I think um, if you said... <laughs> well, no, no. It's Serious question. I think if you said, look, if you want to use, you know, 100 megabytes or something, that's, then that's fine. But if you want to start watching YouTube videos in the lab at university, then you should pay a bit extra. Then what's wrong with that? Okay, Kapo. Um, we think that universities and politics play a very important part in our IT future. Not only them, also Wananga sector. I just wanted to quickly touch on one of the computer clubhouses that I'm aware of, and that is the one at. Um, Awanui Yarangi, Te Whariwananga Awanui Yarangi in Whakatane, it's called Tech Pa, and it's actually had some really awesome social and cultural outcomes because it is about using the internet and using digital technology as a means of engaging youth to get interested and get enrolled into digital degrees and diplomas in the future, and that's um, for young people who are still in high school or maybe slightly disengaged from education. So I think that, yes, they're very important, but we could also expand our horizons a little bit more, and we should be measuring effectiveness and effective support to students by not only looking at their skill set, but also looking at the social, cultural, and economic outcomes that can come as well. Stephen Joyce. Well, firstly, I'm trying to find Control F on my iPhone. Um, and I've got a problem with that, but um, look, um, the um, Look, I think, I think that the reality is if you're talking about a digital economy, then digital economy and education go hand in hand and they actually feed off each other. I think the, the potential for everybody to be better educated um, uh, with the power of what we're dealing with here is actually obvious and you can see it happening now. Uh, and that applies at universities and polytechnics as much as it applies across the school sector. People get particularly excited about the school sector and, uh, because it's a, it's a sector that's been underdone in the IT space. We've got um, too many kids that are going down to a computer lab once a week, whereas out in the real world they'd be using one every hour of every day. Uh, and, uh, and we'll hope not every hour, but, um, but certainly being much more involved with it. So we tend to get more focus on that. But actually, the link between the two, between education uh, and the digital economy uh, is massive. It actually extends the reach of every student, whether they're at school, university, polytech or whatever, allows them more opportunities to see more things and to explore more things than they ever were able to do when I went to university. And I think that's fantastic. All right, and on that, well, positive note, um, it's almost time to end. Now, I've been asked to wrap up, and I actually think in a digital age, asking a moderator to wrap up a discussion is ridiculous because I know the discussion and the points we have raised and talked about this evening are going to spin off in a hundred different forums in a hundred different places, and the discussion will not end here. It will continue, as will, alas, the election campaign. Um, I wish you all luck on that. I thank you all very much indeed uh, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, Peter McCaffrey, Gareth Hughes, Claire Curran, uh, Kapua Smith and uh, Stephen Joyce. Uh, thanks uh, also to Sarah Putt and Rob O'Neill for helping us out. Thanks to uh, Vikram Kumar and also for the technical team for keeping us online and getting the microphones uh, working. Uh, thank you all very much in the audience and in the online audience. Have a great evening.